is basically how genes are controlled, how they are regulated, um, how they are turned on, how they are turned off, and what exactly does that mean. So we are going to talk about the regulation of gene expression. So what is gene control? What is gene regulation? Um, when we talk about you know when genes are turned off it means that the gene is turned off and then we cannot make the protein product or the product anymore. Well when we talk about how genes are turned on we talk about how that process goes from genes DNA to mRNA to protein or amino acid sequence and that's when we are expressing um, going from our genotype to our phenotype so that means we want to make the protein product so we are going to turn genes on we are going to turn transcription on and translation on and allow those process to carry out so why do we need to turn genes on or off aren't they just on all the time well no they're not um, you know sometimes we need to turn them on to respond to certain environmental changes. Uh, for example, E. coli will only turn genes on to metabolize lactose, the sugar, when it's in its environment. Um, at other times, those genes are turned off. Well, why do we do that? Well, it just saves the organism resources and energy. That way, it's not wasted when lactose isn't in the environment to metabolize. And then we only turn genes on when we need it. Um, a good example is when we are undergoing development, um, you know, developing as, you know, from embryo to a fetus to a baby to a child to an adult. Well, certain genes are turned off, sub, um, certain genes are turned on so that we can have those um, tissues develop. And then as we age, there's a lot of genes that turn off. So that means we don't make the protein product any longer. A really good example is, you know, with our hair graying. Well, you know, the color, the pigment of our hair color is melanin pigment. And that's a protein. And then, you know, normally, you know, our genes are turned on to make that pigment color, but as we age, we no longer need it and need to save those resources and those energy to go to other parts of our body um, for the cell, you know, to use to do other things. So what do we do? We turn it off. And then that means that we, as we age, um, human beings and, you know, even animals, we start to gray and lose that pigmentation, that melanin protein product um, is no longer um, being made, so those genes are turned off. Well, how do cells become different cells if all cells in our body, if all of our somatic cells have the same exact DNA genome? Well, here, you know, in this picture, we have a single cell, it undergoes mitosis, and then to become two daughter cells that have the same exact DNA genome, the same exact DNA sequence. But this daughter cell will eventually become a neuron, whereas this daughter cell will eventually become an epithelial cell like a skin cell. Well, how do each of these cells know what to become and how do they become what they need to be in regards to their structure or their function. Well, all of these cells, they'll go through a process called differentiation, where they become specialized in what they need to become. So they'll become specialized in their structure. So this neuron will eventually, the cell will eventually become a neuron to have these cell extensions and then function to um, carry out electrical impulses. Whereas the skin cell will become, you know, flatter or, you know, um, they'll have a protein keratin in there. Um, it'll become specialized in what they need to be in their structure and function. So that means that this cell has differentiated into a neuron based on the cell signaling it gets in their location um, where they are in the body to tell them, hey, you need to come be you need to become a neuron. You need to become a nerve cell. Whereas here, this cell 
where it's located in the body will receive signals from that area to differentiate into an epithelial cell or a skin cell. And then the process of differentiation is all based on selective gene expression. So here, the, own, the genes that are turned on are only ones that pertain to the structure and function of being a skin cell, whereas other, cell, other genes are being turned off. For example, the genes that pertain to being a neuron in this cell are turned off. You don't want the cell to be confused, oh, should it be a skin cell or should it be a, you know, be a neuron cell or a nerve cell? Um, and the same thing you know, goes here. All genes that pertains to being a nerve cell in regards to its shape and its function are turned on, whereas all the other genes that pertains to being a liver cell or being a skin cell or being an eye cell are turned off. So that's selective gene expression. Only certain genes are um, expressed, turned on, and then others are turned off. So this is, you know, a really good um, concept to know about because that's it explains how a liver cell becomes a liver cell or how a muscle cell becomes a muscle cell. You know, for instance, on your skin, you wouldn't want retinal cells to uh, to develop. You wouldn't want cells to differentiate into eye cells on your skin. That wouldn't be good. So how are all these genes turned off, turned on? How are they controlled? What, you know, what tells them, you know, how do we need to know, you know, which are turned on, which are turned off? Well, it has to do with, you know, accessibility. Um, if the DNA is accessible, that means that we can go through transcription. That means we can go through translation. You know, it also means that you know, if the DNA is accessible, that means that RNA polymerase can access the DNA, access that gene, and is able to undergo transcription, and ultimately the ribosome can translate that mRNA into a protein. Well, that accessibility depends on DNA packing. So here we have our DNA and is chromatin form, uncondensed. You know, here we can assess the access the DNA to undergo transcription translation. So that means that the gene would be turned off. But here, as the DNA gets more coiled, that DNA becomes inaccessible, where we can't get to the DNA, where that RNA polymerase can't get to the DNA um, and undergo transcription, and then turn. You know, it can't turn off. It can't turn on the gene. And then here, there are some helpers to pack the DNA, to condense the DNA, to tightly coil that DNA. We have our histone proteins associated with our DNA strands. And what happens is the, the DNA will wrap around those histone proteins. And then what it will resemble are beads on a string. So the beads are our histones, those, these proteins, and then we'll have linker DNA strand to connect these linkers, these beads. And then ultimately it'll become more coiled and more coiled. And then what you see is this metaphase stage of mitosis where the DNA is really inaccessible. And then this DNA packing, it is passed down to daughter cells. So whatever um, stretch of DNA is packed, that stretch in the same daughter cell will be packed as well. So it'll be um, inherited through cell divisions. A concept that is important is called epigenetic inheritance where this doesn't really involve the actual DNA sequence, the actual nucleotides like adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, um, but actually it's what's attached to those nucleotides. You can have what are called chemical modifications, and then there are several different types, but for this class and for this exam, the only one that you need to know really is um, 
DNA methylation. So here um, we can add a methyl group, a chemical modification, on a nucleotide to turn the genes off. So when we turn the genes off, we no longer can have transcription, we can no longer have translation to make the protein product. And then here's what it, a picture of what it kind of looks like. So here we have a methyl group attached to a stretch of DNA. Well, what that'll do is that it'll inactivate that gene and then it'll make the DNA more coiled, um, more packed or more inaccessible so that we can turn that gene off and we can't get transcription, we can't get translation. So it's important, you know, so throughout our life, some genes will be turned off as we don't need it. And then these DNA methylation, these chemical modifications on the DNA sequence, it can be irreversible. So if we need to, we can just take off that methyl group and enzyme will do that. And then um, we can turn those genes back on. So are these gene modifications passed down to daughter cells? Yes, they are. Um, during DNA replication, the DNA um, polymerase, they'll actually add the nucleotides, replicate the DNA strands, but they'll also uh, replicate the DNA methyl groups on the sequence. So it will be passed down through cell divisions during the replication period or that stage. So how are these modifications related to cancer? Well, if a gene is supposed to be turned off and then, you know, but it's actually turned on, and also if this gene pertains to a DNA repair gene, that can be, that can lead to cancer ultimately, okay? So if you were supposed to have these repair genes, these repair genes that will modify or correct the DNA mutations and it gets turned off and then they don't do their job, well then you're just going to have uh, cell divisions or mitosis of the mutation and that can ultimately lead to cancer. Or what if those genes pertain to cell cycle control genes? Well, it's supposed to be turned on but it's turned off by methylation and then that can ultimately lead to cancer as well. Um, control genes that are supposed to regulate the cell cycle um, so that you can control cancer. Well, if those genes are turned off, then definitely can lead to cancer. Another importance that epigenetic inheritance pertains to is the concept of twins. So identical twins, they have the same DNA makeup, the same exact DNA sequence. You know, here, oh, these two babies are so cute. So they, these two babies, these two identical twins will have the same DNA copies in each of their cells. But how do you explain these twins ultimately growing up to be so different um, in how they act, how they, you know, their mannerisms or, you know, how their lives are lived? Well, it all has to do with these epigenetic inheritance patterns. As we grow up, um, we, you know, if, when these twins are first born, when, or even when they're first in the womb, they have the same epigenetic um, genome, the same epigenetic inheritance patterns, the same epigenetic tags, but as they grow up, through their childhood, through their adolescence, and then, you know, things in their environment um, will change their epigenetic genome. It'll change their epigenetic tags, you know, which genes are methylated, which genes aren't. Those will become different in, in these two twins so that now these twins, the way that which genes will be expressed in these two twins are different. So it explains to, you know, explains how these two twins can be so different um, when they age, when they get older, but they still have the same exact um, DNA genome. The only thing that's really changed molecularly are those epigenetic tags, 
which genes are methylated and which genes are not methylated. Another way to control gene expression is something that's called X inactivation. So ladies, we have two X chromosomes. Um, and then these two X chromosomes are a lot bigger than a male's Y chromosome. So a way to kind of compensate for that or even up the genes, you know, in males and females is that in females, one of our X chromosomes will be inactivated. So what happens during embryonic development in each cell um, each cell, one of the X chromosomes will be randomly inactivated. And then how it gets inactivated is that it'll condense into something that's called a bar body. So here we have a picture of a bar body. So these are two X chromosomes. One is a normally functioning X chromosome that can have its genes expressed, whereas this bar body, well, it has the DNA packing, the, um, it's being condensed, so now we can't get access to it, so it is inactivated. And then a really good example is that here, this can be readily seen in tortoise shell cats or calico cats. So these cats will have different fur colors, and then these are affected by the X inactivation concept. So for these cats, they have to be heterozygotes. So they have to have an allele that will code for the black fur color and an allele that will code for the orange fur color. And then which X inactivation occurs is random. It could come from the mom, it could come from the dad. So here we'll say that this black fur color, this allele comes from the mom, and then this one comes from the dad. Well, in this cell population here, it's the allele for the black fur color that gets inactivated. The one that came from mom is inactivated. And then the only one that is expressed is the allele for orange fur color that came from dad. And then that's why you see in this cell population here, the only fur color that is expressed is the orange fur color. Whereas here in this population of cells, it's the mom's uh, allele for black fur color that is expressed, whereas the allele, the X chromosome that came from dad for the orange fur color turns into a bar body and gets inactivated. And then that's why you only see the black fur color over in this section of the cat. We have something that's called homeotic genes. And then these genes, you can say that they are basically the master control genes that control where a head will go, where the thorax will go, where the limbs will go, and where the posterior of the body will go. Um, you know, these homeotic genes, they actually regulate where the body segments go, where the anatomy of the body is, how it will be uh, structurally. So for instance, in here, you know, this is a fruit fly, and then here, you know, it'll determine you know, where the head will go, where the thorax will go, and then where the posterior um, body segment goes. And then if there's a mutation in these homeotic genes, what happens is in the fruit fly, it can make this fruit fly have a pair of wings or a pair of legs, sorry, a pair of legs in its head region where it's not supposed to be. So these legs were supposed to go where the thorax goes. So in the wild, this fruit fly would not be able to survive. But here, whereas this one has normal homeotic genes, um, these normal homeotic genes, what they do is that they will regulate other genes that control where the body segments go.
So this is always a fun topic, biotechnology. So I know that, you know, the new, um, there's a lot about current events about biotechnology, the advances in that field. Well, it all basically comes from this um, process called nuclear transplantation. Okay, so nuclear transplantation, what does that mean? Well, you're taking the nucleus of one cell um, out and then putting, transplanting a new nucleus into that cell, basically what it is. And then from nuclear transplantation, you can get the process of reproductive cloning, where you can actually get a new organism, the birth of a new organism, or you could carry out therapeutic cloning and then you can get these stem cells to become other types of cells. So therapeutic cloning is for you know repair or replacement of um, tissues, damaged tissues, um, you know organs, etc., like that. So this nuclear transportation, what you do is you start off with an egg cell. You take that nucleus out, and then remember, an egg cell only has, for us, only has 23 chromosomes. So it doesn't have the full complement of genes, the full complement of DNA. So it can never become a whole organism. But if we take that nucleus out, and then we transplant the nucleus of, a, of an adult somatic cell. So remember, somatic cells have all... 46 chromosomes in us, it has that full complement of DNA, and then we put that into the egg cell, and then we let it undergo mitosis, and then what it does is that it'll grow into a ball of cells called a blastocyst, blastocyst. And then from that blastocyst, we can either use it to undergo reproductive cloning or therapeutic cloning. So here, if we undergo uh, reproductive cloning, we insert that blastocyst into a surrogate mother. And then the surrogate mother will actually act like an incubator, let that blastocyst um, become an embryo, become a fetus, and then you get the birth of a whole organism. And then I know everybody's heard about the clone sheep named Dolly. So Dolly is very interesting. Her experiment actually was a very intensive experiment. It had a lot of failures where they did about 300 nuclear transplantations in the time around 1996. And then they were only able to have... 30 blastocysts come from that 300 nuclear transplantation. So they had 30 blastocysts inserted into 30 surrogate mothers, but only one sheep came from those 30 blastocysts, and then that sheep was Dolly. But Dolly, she is a clone, she was a clone animal, but had health issues. And then her lifespan was about only half of a normal sheep's lifespan. So I know that in years of technology advancements, we have improved the health of these clone organisms, but there are still health concerns um, with these clone organisms, with these species. So let me ask you this. The clone will be genetically identical to whom? Will it be genetically identical to the egg cell, the somatic cell donor, the surrogate mother? I'll give you guys a minute or two to think about that. Whose DNA is in Dolly? Well, it would be the somatic cell donor, the nucleus that we implanted into the egg, egg cell. So she would be identical to whoever that somatic cell came from. And then there's a controversy to cloning. You know, some people are for it, some people are against it. But, you know, let's talk about, you know, some types of 
um, organisms that have been cloned. Well, we know the sheep's been cloned, dogs have been cloned, cats have been cloned, um, the fruit flies have been cloned, even pigs have been cloned. So, and then it's gonna, and I believe a uh, baby, um, a human baby in China had just been cloned. So what are some problems with cloning? Some people, for some people, it could be religious reasons. Uh, for some people, it would be animal cruelty. Okay, so all this research starts with animals. Um, and then the way that, you know, some scientists or some labs may treat animals is not very um, humane. And then what I've said earlier, um, the health issues and shorter lifespans of these clone organisms. So we need to figure out, you know, what's causing those. And then maybe, you know, these organisms that have been cloned are going to be used for organs or parts. So they're not going to be treated as humanely as possible. So if we can use these organisms for um, these animals for organs or parts, well, if we clone humans already, and then that would be a new trend to clone humans, couldn't humans be sold as a whole or even as for parts? That's a real possibility. And then, you know, animals or clone humans could be treated as property. And then with cloning, from an evolution standpoint, cloning does not increase genetic diversity. It greatly um, reduces genetic diversity. So, you know, in that regard, we are kind of disregarding or um, not putting the importance of sexual reproduction and family. And then that also leads to something that's called eugenics. So eugenics is when you are picking out certain genes so that you can make the perfect animal or even the perfect human. So, you know, that leads to designer babies. You know, we've kind of done it for dogs already with our artificial um, selection, our breeding um, for thousands of years. So we could do that for humans, but in the lab. And then another um, problem with cloning that I want to bring up is that, well, if we're cloning pigs, you know, or cattle, well, these cloned anim animals could be used for farming. And then would the public be aware of this? Would the public be made knowledgeable of this? How would you feel if you were eating a cloned organism? And then one of the most important controversy with cloning is that when does life begin? So here, what you have to, you know, with reproductive cloning, um, you know, you're still getting the birth of an organism, but therapeutic cloning, you basically have to destroy um, this embryo, harvest it, not destroy, you have to harvest it, you know, to become parts or to become, you know, a heart cell or a nervous cell. But this embryo could have been a life. So that's a controversy. You know, when does life begin? Does it begin when the cells are in that blastocyst state, in that embryo state, or when it's a fetus, or when it's being born? So for therapeutic cloning, there's some types of stem cells. There's three types of stem cells, but the only two, um, ones that you have to know for this class is called one is called embryonic stem cells. So these embryonic stem cells, they um, come from the blastocyst. Okay. So here in the blastocyst, you know, we can culture it in the lab, and then we can also induce it, shock it, um, change its medium, so that we can differentiate it to whatever types of cells we want. 
So these embryonic stem cells, they can give rise to basically all types of uh, specialized cells. So these embryonic stem cells are called pluripotent, pluripotent. Whereas these adult stem cells, they are actually in our bodies now as adults. Um, there's not much controversy with adult stem cells because you're just taking a tissue sample from you know, our body as an adult. Um, so you're not destroying a blastocyst. And then these adult stem cells, um, they have more limitations than these embryonic stem cells. So these will only differentiate into certain types of cells. So for example, um, adult stem cells in bone marrow, the inside of your bone, these can only differentiate into blood cells like your white blood cells or your red blood cells. And you can find some adult stem cells in your retina, but these um, stem cells can only differentiate into retinal cells. They wouldn't be able to differentiate into a brain cell or a pancreatic cell, whereas these embryonic stem cells can differentiate. So as scientists, scientists, they would like these embryonic stem cells because they don't have much limitations. And then, you know, scientists can do much more with these embryonic stem cells. But there's more controversy with these embryonic stem cells because they involve the blastocysts, harvesting these blastocysts. Now let's talk about cancer. Um, so there's some terminology to know. We have proto-oncogenes. So proto-oncogenes are genes that normally code for growth factor proteins. So do you guys remember from chapter 8 what growth factor proteins are? So these proteins, they will uh, signal a cell to let it know that it's time to undergo cell division, to undergo mitosis. So it's like a signal. Well, these proto-oncogenes, they have the potential to become what's called an oncogene. So oncogenes are cancer-causing genes. So these proto-oncogenes could, could eventually develop into oncogenes, and then that could be caused by um, chemical agents, physical agents, chemical agents, you know, like drugs, alcohol, physical agents such as x-rays, um, UV rays, sun, but also what can cause proto-oncogenes to become oncogenes are viruses. There's the human papilloma virus that can cause cervix cancer in women. You can have bacteria, the heliobacter um, bacteria that can cause stomach cancer. So these are some of the things that can cause um, cancer in us. So they can cause a proto-oncogene to become an oncogene. There is another type of genes that is associated with cancer. These are called tumor suppressor genes. And then I'll give you guys a second to guess what they do. Well, basically they will control cell division. They control mitosis so that we don't get too much cell division. We don't get too much um, mitosis. So in this picture here, we have a normal tumor suppressor gene. It suppresses tumors. What it does, it codes for a protein that will inhibit cell division so that we can get the normal number of cell divisions, the normal number of mitosis that we need. But if there's a mutation in this tumor suppressor gene, the inhibiting protein is not functional, it's defective. So it can't no longer do its job. So what happens if so what happens when we get that mutation is that we'll get um, cell replication, cell replication, mitosis, mitosis. 
there's a gene that is a tumor suppressor gene called the P53 gene that codes for P53 protein. And then this P53 gene, it also regulates the cell cycle. So this protein, this P53 protein, it can arrest cells to give it time to repair DNA if it's damaged. And then if we if it can't give it time, then it'll actually induce apoptosis. So remember that this is programmed cell death. So that means if the DNA is damaged and then there's no way to repair it, um, that means that the um, cell can't replicate. So that's good. We are controlling mitosis. But there's a virus called the human papilloma virus that causes cervix cancer. And then this virus actually binds to the 53 gene and it'll inactivate it. So that means that we can no long, longer get um, tumor suppressor proteins. And then that means that we will get a crazy amount of cell division, crazy amount of mitosis. And that leads to cervix cancer. Well, these P53 genes have been associated with breast cancer. Um, there's two genes. We have our BRCA genes 1 and gene 2 on these chromosomes. And then if there's mutations in these P53 genes on those um, chromosomes, it could ultimately lead to breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So why does risk of cancer increase with age? You know, just because you have one mutation doesn't mean that you're going to automatically get cancer. Cancer, it takes a while to develop in the general population, in a lot of people. It means that you just have to accumulate these mutations throughout your lifetime. And generally, of course, there's exceptions. You need about four or more mutations to accumulate to get cancer. For example, you can have an oncogene that's activated, so a cancer-causing gene, and then you get increased mitosis. Or you can get, and then afterwards, you can get a tumor suppressor gene inactivated, like a P53 gene. And then you can get another um, tumor suppressor gene inactivated. So it's the accumulation of these mutations that will ultimately cause cancer. So that's why it takes a while for people to get cancer, to develop cancer. Um, you know, the older we get, the more mutations we accumulate. And then that's why you see, you know, uh, old people or older people getting cancer. But nowadays, it seems like younger people are getting cancer um, at a faster rate. So it leads you to ask the question, is it something that you know the younger generation is doing that is um, causing these mutations to accumulate faster than before? <laughs>